Howdy, 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 my name is Anachi Sasuke. Welcome back to Let's Read Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. In this episode, we're going to be reading the chapter Other Dangers. And it says, Most of the scary stories in this book have been passed down over the years, but the ones in this chapter have been told only in recent times. They are stories that young people often tell about dangers we face in our lives today. So, let's see what kind of stories these are going to be. It works out because right now it's super, super windy outside. So there's just going to be spooky wind noises for me while I'm reading this, so that works out. The hook. I don't think hooks factor into spooky wind noises, but anyway. Donald and Sarah went to the movies. Then they went for a ride in Donald's car. They parked up on a hill at the edge of town. From there they could see the lights up and down the valley. Donald turned on the radio and found some music, but an announcer broke in with a news bulletin. A murderer had escaped from the state prison. He was armed with a knife and was headed south on foot. His left hand was missing. In his place, he wore a hook. Let's roll up the windows and lock the doors, said Sarah. That's a good idea, said Donald. That prison isn't too far away, Sarah said. Maybe we should go home. But it's only ten o'clock, said Donald. I don't care what time it is, she said. I want to go home. Look, Sarah, said Donald. He's not going to climb all the way up here. Why would he do that? Even if he did, all the doors are locked. How would he get in? Donald, he could take that hook and break through a window and open a door, she said. I'm scared. I want to go home, Donald was annoyed. Girls are always afraid of something, he said. As he started the car, Sarah thought she heard something, or some someone or something scratching at her door. Did you hear that? She asked as they roared away. It sounded like somebody was trying to get in. Oh, sure, said Donald. Soon, soon they got to her house. Would you like to come in and have some cocoa? She asked. No, he said, I've got to go home. He went around to the other side of the car to let her in. Hanging on the door handle was a hook. That guy got up there quick. Let's see. The white satin evening gown. Doesn't look very white to me. Um, a young man invited a young woman to a formal dance, but she was very poor and she could not afford to buy the evening gown she needed for such an occasion. Maybe you can rent a dress, her mother said. So she went to a pawn shop, not a pawn shop? For dresses. Not far from where she lived. There she found a white satin evening gown in her size. She looked lovely in it and she was able to rent it for very little. When she arrived at the dance with her friend, she was so attractive, everyone wanted to meet her. She danced again and again and was having a wonderful time. But then she began to feel dizzy and faint, and she asked her friends to take her home. I, I think I've danced too much, she told him. When she got home, she lay down on her bed. The next morning, her mother found that her daughter had died. The doctor did not understand what had caused her death, so he had the coroner perform an autopsy. The coroner found that she had been poisoned by embalming fluid. It had stopped her blood from flowing. There were traces of the fluid on her dress. He decided it had entered her skin when she perspired while she was dancing. The pawnbroker said he bought the dress from an undertaker's helper. It had been used in a funeral for another young woman and the helper had stolen it just before she was buried. Wow. Wow, okay. High beams. The girl was driving in the old blue sedan. Or the girl, sorry, the girl driving the old blue sedan was a senior at the high school. She lived on a farm about eight miles away, and she used the car to drive back and forth. She had driven into town that night to see a basketball game. Now she was on her way home. This sounds like part of Twilight. I wonder if that's where this came from. Um, as she pulled away from the school, she noticed a red pickup truck following her out the parking lot. A few minutes later, the truck was still behind her. I, I guess we're going the same direction, she thought. She began to watch the truck in her mirror. When she changed her speed, the driver of the truck changed his speed. When she passed a car, so did he. Then he turned on his high beams, flooding her car with light. He left them on for almost a minute. He probably wants to pass me, she thought, but she was becoming uneasy. Usually she drove home over a back road. Not too many people went that way, but when she turned onto that road, so did the truck. I've got to get away from him, she thought, and she began to drive faster. Then he turned his high beams on again. After a minute, he turned them off. Then he turned them on again, and off again. She drove even faster, but the truck driver stayed right behind her. Then he turned his high beams on again. Once more, her car was ablaze with light. What is he doing? She wondered. What does he want? Then he turned them off again. But a minute later, he turned them on again and he left them on. At last, she pulled into her driveway and the truck pulled in right behind her. She jumped from the car and ran to her house. Call the police! She screamed at her father. Out in the driveway, she could see the driver of the truck. He had a gun in his hand. When the police arrived, they started to arrest him, but he pointed to the girl's car. You don't want me. You want him. Crouched behind the driver's seat, there was a man with a knife. As the driver of the truck explained it, the man slipped into the girl's car just before she left the school. He saw it happen, but there was no way he could stop it. He thought about getting the police, but he was afraid to leave her, so he followed her car. 
Each time the man in the back seat reached up over the reached up to overpower, the driver of the truck turned on his high beams. Then the man dropped down, afraid that someone might see him. No. Oh. So he wasn't such a bad guy after all. He just had an ominous red pickup truck. You know how it is. The babysitter. It was nine o'clock in the evening. Everybody was sitting on the couch in front of the TV. There was Richard, Brian, Jenny, and Doreen, the babysitter. The telephone rang. Is that supposed to be the baby? Maybe it's your mother, Doreen said Doreen. She picked up the phone. Before she could even say a word, a man laughed hysterically and hung up. Who was it? asked Richard. Some nut. What a miss. At 9.30, the telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. It was the man who had called before. I'll be there soon, he said, and he laughed and hung up. Who was it? The children asked. Some crazy person. About 10 o'clock, the telephone rang again. Jenny got to it first. Hello? It was the same man. One more hour, and he laughed and hung up. He said one more hour. What did he mean? Asked Jenny. Don't worry, said Doreen. It's somebody fooling around. I'm scared, said Jenny. About 10.30, the telephone rang once more. When Doreen picked up, the man said, Pretty soon now. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Doreen screamed, and he hung up. Was it that guy again? Asked Brian. Yes. I want to call the operator and complain. The operator told her to call back if it happened again. And she would try to trace the call. At 11 o'clock, the telephone rang again. Doreen answered it. Very soon now. <laughs> and hung up. Doreen called the operator. Almost at once, she called back. That person is calling from a telephone upstairs. You'd better leave. I'll get the police. Oh, jeez. Just then, a door upstairs opened. A man they had never seen before started down the stairs towards them. As they ran from the house, he was smiling in a very strange way. A few minutes later, the police found him there and arrested him. What is that? Oh, I guess it's the next chapter. This chapter has the same title as the first chapter, but the stories in the first chapter are meant to scare you. The ones in this chapter are meant to make you laugh. Well, I, I know I said I was going to have each episode be one chapter, no matter how long it was, but it's only been seven minutes, so I'm going to read this one too. The Viper A widow lived alone on the top floor of an apartment house. One morning, her telephone rang. Hello, she said. This is the Viper, a man said. I'm coming up. Somebody's fooling around, she thought, and hung up. A half hour later, the telephone rang again. It was the same man. It's the Viper. I'll be up soon. The widow didn't know what to think, but she was getting frightened. Once more, the telephone rang. Again, it was the Viper. I'm coming up now, he said. She quickly called the police. They said they would be right over. When the doorbell rang, she sighed with relief. They're here, she thought. But, but when she opened the door, there stood a little old man with a bucket and a cloth. I'm the Viper, he said. I've, I wish to wash and wipe the windows. <laughs> the Attic. A man named Rupert lived with his dog in a house deep in the woods. Rupert was a hunter and a trapper. The dog was a big German shepherd named Sam. Rupert had raised Sam up from a pup. Almost every morning, Rupert went hunting, and Sam stayed behind and guarded the house. One morning, as Rupert was checking his traps, he got the feeling that something was wrong at the house, or at home. He hurried back as fast as he could, but when he got there, he found that Sam was missing. He searched the house and the woods nearby, but Sam was nowhere to be seen. He called and he called, but the dog did not answer. For days, Rupert looked for Sam, but he could not find no trace of him. Finally, he gave up and went back to his work, but one morning he heard something moving in the attic. He picked up his gun, then he thought, I had better be quiet about this. So he took off his boots, and in his bare feet, he began to climb the attic stairs. He slowly took one step, then another, then another, until at last he reached the attic door. He stood outside listening, but he didn't hear a thing. Then he opened the door, and... At this point, the storyteller stops as if he was finished. Then usually somebody will ask, Why did Rupert scream? The storyteller replies, You'd scream too if you stepped on a nail in your bare feet. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was a, uh, opens the door and I was supposed to scream, or if he was screaming. My bad. The Slithery D. The Slithery D. He came out of the sea. He ate all the others, but he didn't eat me. The Slithery D. He came out of the sea. He ate all the others, but he didn't eat slurp. Oh, okay then. I guess I guess he did eat them after all. How that dead man danced. Aaron Kelly's bones. Aaron Kelly was dead. They bought him a coffin and had a funeral and buried him. But that night he got out of his coffin and he came home. His family was sitting around the fire when he walked in. 
He sat down next to his widow and he said, What's going on? You all act like somebody died. Who's dead? His widow said, You are. I don't feel dead. He said, I feel fine. You don't look fine, his widow said. You look dead. You better get back to the grave where you belong. I'm not going back to the grave until I feel dead, he said. Since Aaron wouldn't go back, his widow couldn't collect his life insurance. Without that, she couldn't pay for the coffin, and the undertaker said he would take it back. Aaron didn't care. He just sat by the fire, rocking at a chair and warming his hands and feet. But his joints were dry and his back was stiff, and every time he moved, he creaked and cracked. One night, the best filler in town came to court the widow. Since Aaron was dead, the filler wanted to marry her. The two of them sat on one side of the fire, and Aaron sat on the other side, creaking and cracking. How long do we have to put up with this dead corpse? The widow asked. Something must be done, the filler said. This isn't very jolly, Aaron said. Let's dance. The fiddler got out his fiddle and began to play. Aaron stretched himself, sh sh shook himself, got up and took a step or two and began to dance. With his old bones rattling and his yellow teeth snapping and his bald head wagging and his arms flip-flopping around and around he went. With his long legs clicking and his knee bones knocking, he skipped and pranced around the room. How that dead man danced! But pretty soon a bone worked loose and fell to the floor. Look at that! The fiddler said. Play faster, said the widow. The fiddler played faster. Crickety cracked down and back. The dead man went hopping and his dry bones kept dropping. This way, that way, the pieces just kept popping. Play, man, play! The, cried the widow. The fiddler fiddled and dead Aaron danced. Then Aaron fell apart, collapsed into a pile of bones. All except his bald head bone that... That grinned at the fiddler, cracked his teeth and kept dancing. Look at that! groaned the fiddler. Play louder! cried the widow. Ho ho! said the head bone. Aren't we having fun? The fiddler couldn't stand it. Widow, he said, I'm going home, and he never came back. The fiddler gathered up Aaron's bones and put them back in the coffin. It mixed them up so they couldn't f he couldn't fit them together. After that, Aaron stayed in his grave. But his widow never did get married again. Aaron had seen to that. Wait till Martin comes. An old man was out for a walk. When a storm came up, he looked for a place to take shelter. Soon he came to an old house. He ran up the porch and knocked on the door, but nobody answered. By now, rain was pouring down, thunder was booming, and the lightning was flashing. So he tried the door. When he found it was unlocked, he went inside. Except for a pile of wooden boxes, the house was empty. He broke up some of the boxes and made a fire with them. Then he sat down in front of the fire and dried himself. It was so warm and cozy that he fell asleep. When he woke up, a black cat was sitting near the fire. Stared at him for a while, then it purred. That's a nice cat, he thought, and he dozed off again. When he opened his eyes, there was a second cat in the room, but this one was as big as a wolf. It looked at him very closely and it asked, Shall we do it now? No, said the other cat. Let's wait till Martin comes. Pfft, I must be dreaming, thought the old man. He closed his eyes again. Then he took another look, but now there was a third cat in the room, and this one is as big as a tiger. He looked the man over and it asked, Shall we do it now? No, said the others, let's wait till Martin comes. The old man jumped up, jumped out the window, started running. When Martin comes, you tell him I couldn't wait, he called. <laughs> I wonder what Martin would have been. The ghost with the bloody fingers. A businessman arrived at a hotel late one night and asked for a room. The room clerk told him the hotel was all filled up. There's only one empty room, he said, but we don't rent that one because it's haunted. I'll take it, said the businessman. I don't believe in ghosts. The man went up to the room, he unpacked his things, and he went to bed. As soon as he did, a ghost came out of the closet. His fingers were bleeding. It was moaning, Bloody fingers! Bloody fingers! When the man saw the ghost, he grabbed his things and ran. The next night, a woman arrived very late. Again, all the rooms were taken except the haunted room. I'll sleep there, she said. I'm not afraid of ghosts. As soon as she got into bed, the ghost came out of the closet. Its fingers were still bleeding. It was still moaning, Bloody fingers! Bloody fingers! And the woman took one look and ran. A week later, another guest arrived very late. He also took the haunted room. After he unpacked, he got out his guitar and he began to play. Soon the ghost appeared, as before its fingers were bleeding, and it was moaning, Bloody fingers! Bloody fingers! The man paid no attention, he just kept strumming his guitar. But the ghost kept moaning and his fingers kept bleeding. Finally, the guitar player looked up. Cool it, man, he said. Get yourself a band-aid. Let's see, abbreviations. Wait, so is that the end of the book? Is there just like 30 pages of other things? Notes. Hmm. 
I, I guess that was it then. Look like it's just a bunch of pages of citations and stuff. Of, like, what they used for the... Yeah, it looks like it's just uh, descriptions of what the stories came from. Sources. Strange and scary. The source of each item is given along with variants and related information. Where available, the names of collectors C and information I are given. The publications cited are described in the bibliography. Cool. Okay, cool. It just says where all the stories came from. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so I guess that's it for Let's Read Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I don't know which what episode this was, but I'm glad I didn't split it into two really small episodes and just had this one last one. So, uh, if you liked it, a like and a subscribe will be groovy. If you didn't, you need to do either one of those things, and I'll see if I can find the other books in the series. If I can, I'll do those too, but in the meantime, I have something else I can do for Mondays. So, thanks again for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Later!